Greetings and salutations fellow book readers. This is Mark and the book I will review today is The Grand Chessboard. Before we continue, this is personalized limited edition of The Grand Chessboard with leather cover designed and made by me. At the end of the video, I will tell you a couple of ways of how you can get one for yourself if you are interested. Now let's get back to the review. The Grand Chessboard is the 1997 book about international politics written by Zbigniew Brzezinski. Brzezinski was a Polish-born American diplomat and political scientist. He is probably best known, at least to the older people, as Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, but he also had a long career as a geopolitical expert. His father was a Polish diplomat posted to Berlin from 1931 to 1935 and Moscow from 36 to 38. Between those two experiences, he witnessed the formation and workings of a totalitarian state, which made him a lifelong anti-communist and in general opposed to any form of dictatorship. And this was the foundation for his political views. Also, the destruction of his home country by the Nazi Germany and later brutal takeover by the Soviet Union disguised as liberation further reinforced his opinions and beliefs. Brzezinski dedicated his life to the expansion of the American geopolitical power and undermining of any government who was not aligned with the American democratic ideals. What is the Grand Chessboard about? It is about the American geopolitical vision of the world and how it should be maintained through effective geostrategy. It lays out the need for America's new post-Cold War international strategy and presents problems and opportunities the collapse of the Soviet Union created. I read somewhere that Brzezinski said History is much more the product of chaos than of conspiracy, which I don't know if he really believed, but I do, and based on this I wouldn't take literally everything he says, but rather as a possible scenario. A bit of the plot. The plot is a description of the geopolitically important parts of the world and the dangers and opportunities they present for the American hegemony, I will briefly summarize the chapters and add some of my own thoughts. In the introduction, Brzezinski gives historical background for the modern geopolitical strategy, the importance of the Euro-Asian landmass and how for the first time a non-Euro-Asian country is the dominant world power. Also he mentions how Hitler and Stalin saw the America's potential and agreed to keep its influence out of Euroasia, but knowing pre-war American reluctance to get involved in the old world politics, I don't think it was something the two dictators spent a lot of time on. Also, Hitler's allies in Japan had different ideas about it, and the American involvement actually benefited Stalin after the Soviet Union was attacked by Germany. Chapter 1 hegemony of a new type, tells us that the United States is the first truly global power and gives the historical trajectory on how it arrived there, starting with the Spanish-American War, then the World War I and II, and the 50-year Cold War struggle against the Soviet Union for the global domination. And finally, the emergence of the United States as the first and the only global superpower and the similarities it shared with previous empires, especially Rome, but also China, Mongolia, Spain and Great Britain. The last part focuses on the uniqueness of the American global system, the so-called American exceptionalism, which probably is more of an American fantasy than globally accepted reality. To be fair, Brzezinski was also skeptical about it, he said in one of his interviews, American exceptionalism is a reaction to the inability of people to understand global complexities 
or important issues like American energy dependency. Therefore, they search for simplistic sources of comfort and clarity. And the people that they are now selecting to be, so to speak, the spokespersons of their anxieties are in most cases stunningly ignorant. Unlike the previous empires, America isn't interested in territorial gains, says Brzezinski. I would say yes, America got all the land it needs through its 19th century expansionist politics. Further, in the modern world, adding territories creates more problems than gains, as can be seen in the European countries' 20th century colonial headaches. When the British realized they were giving more than receiving, they rather quickly rid themselves of their empire. America learned well and seems to prefer government change, to which of course it doesn't admit, but there are facts such as Iraq, Afghanistan and the latest Ukraine. To be fair, many previous empires found out it was easier to install a friendly or puppet leader than military occupation. Romans already practiced it, the difference was they received tax payments, and America gets more indirect benefits such as economic preferences and geostrategic advantages. There are many more similarities to Rome than America would like to admit. For me, America politically is in the place somewhat reminiscent of Rome of Julius Caesar. For the first 400 years of its existence, Rome was a republic, but because of political corruption and extreme polarization, the Senate voted to give Julius Caesar dictatorial powers, which led to his assassination and civil war. The aftermath was victory of Octavio, who transformed Rome into an empire and declared himself Augustus the first emperor, and we had another 500 years of Roman hegemony. Perhaps for the present hegemony, there are parallels to be seen and conclusions to be drawn. Chapter 2, the Euro-Asian chessboard, reiterates the importance of Euro-Asia, especially for America in its two flanks, Western and Eastern. Euro-Asia is thus the chessboard on which the struggle for global primacy continues to be played. Brzezinski states that America's supremacy on the Euro-Asian landmass is shallow and somewhat limited by its democratic system. He says the trick to maintain control is in uniting the players, but at the same time to keep them divided. Also, he mentions how the geopolitical strategy has changed over the centuries, shifting from land gains to the control of the seas, Probably another reason America doesn't care for territorial gains. A hundred years ago, the mantra was Who rules Eastern Europe commands the heartland. Who rules the heartland commands the world island. Who rules the world island commands the world. Today, perhaps something similar can be said about the oceans. Further, the book talks about geostrategic players of which principal are Germany, France, Russia, China, and India, and geopolitical pivots, the main being Ukraine, which somewhat explains why the intense struggle today between Russia and America led West for its control. The others are Azerbaijan, South Korea, Turkey, and Iran, and it describes their ambitions and roles and what opportunities and challenges they present for the United States, especially some type of strategic anti-American alliance of China, Russia, and Iran. In 1997 versus 2022, the fear became reality with a few more additions, such as nuclear-armed North Korea and probably Iran as well. Chapter 3, The Democratic Bridgehead, focuses on Europe and its relation with America. Brzezinski says that Europe is America's natural ally since it is the original home for most of its population and the two share many values. And I would say that America can be even seen as a cultural extension 
and political continuation of Europe. And there is NATO, without which there is no American presence in Europe. And expansion of NATO is basically expansion of American influence, since the countries in it remain to a certain extent American protectorates. The expansion of NATO is also needed to keep Russia in check, therefore lies further importance of Ukraine, which either enhances power of NATO or Russia. Another issue facing America and its global superpower status is the European Union, which presents a new set of problems and opportunities. The idea is to make it strong enough to enhance American geopolitical power, but not strong and independent enough to transform it into a competitor. Further, Brzezinski insists that expansion of NATO and EU has to maintain an open door for Russia, which unfortunately seems to have been closed after Putin came to power. The West seems to have preferred weak Yeltsin, which to me is a bit of a surprise since under him Russia was unstable and a danger to global stability. Putin might not be a nice guy and somewhat of a dictator, but he keeps Russia out of chaos. And I am not sure the West's dream of no Putin democratic Russia is possible, at least not in the short run. Russia, contrary to the West, doesn't have any democratic traditions, and we know from recent history what happens when you try to stick democracy where it is not welcome. Also, I am not sure America wants a strong democratic Russia inside the European Union, Perhaps the EU wouldn't need America as much, thus weakening its global position. The most painful consequence of the fall of the Soviet Union was the loss of Ukraine, because the three Slavic states, Russia, Belarus and Ukraine, formed the core of globally powerful Russia. Brzezinski writes, The most important, however, is Ukraine, and once ready, it will want to join EU and NATO. Sometimes between 2005 and 2015, Ukraine's ascension to Europe will bring Russia to a decision to either approximate or become an outcast. For Russia, this will not be just a geopolitical choice, but a question of survival. And further, it cannot be stressed enough that without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be an empire. But with Ukraine, suborned and then subordinated, Russia automatically becomes an empire. And this is the answer for the people who wonder why Ukraine and its loyalties is such a big deal. Further, Brzezinski argues that the biggest preoccupation for weak Russia is not NATO, but growing and powerful China, which will likely colonize the empty central Siberia and fracture the country further. To me, this is a bit similar to the way Russia lost Alaska. After the discovery of gold, so many Americans moved there that the only option remaining for Russia was to sell it for a ridiculous price or have it eventually annexed by the United States and receive nothing. Brzezinski says that Russia is also confused about its identity. Many Russians say that Russia is not Europe and it is not Asia, but it is both and therefore unique. And I think this self-proclaimed uniqueness must make Russians feel alone and disconnected from other nations. I remember a Russian girl once told me, Russia has no friends, Russia has its army and its navy. I think originally it was said by one of the Russia's czars and repeated by Putin. The sentiment of being different as a nation is not that rare, and there are plenty of examples. It reminds me a bit of the early 20th century Japan, to which some Japanese referred as orphan of nations, stuck somewhere between the modern West and traditional East, and the disaster this created for them. Chapter 5. The Euro-Asian Balkans refers to the Caucasus and Central Asian states, all ex-Soviet republics, with exception of Afghanistan, Brzezinski compares the region to the European Balkans because it is strategic and unstable, where outside states play against each other. 
The main players are Russia, Turkey and Iran, and secondary are Ukraine, Pakistan, US and India. China decided to stay out of it to avoid problems in its own Muslim regions, but since the book publishing, China's policy has changed drastically and is an active player in the region. The area's importance is based on its wealth of raw materials. Uh, that's why Ukraine is one of the players, because it offers the possibility of independence from Russia's energy resources. I think America's interest in the region is secondary and comes down to minimizing Russia's and China's influence over it. Chapter 6, The Far Eastern Anchor, focuses, as the title stipulates, on the extreme east of Euroasia. Brzezinski writes that for China, its natural ally is America and its natural enemies are Japan and Russia. Unfortunately, today's reality is different and I think most of the blame lies in China's ambitions. It is kind of becoming a bully to its neighbors and has many territorial disputes with them, so no wonder they are seeking another power to protect them. I think America's success in Euroasia lies in the country not being in Euroasia. Being far away from Europe and the Far East makes it seem less of a competitor. I think in general humans, if they need somebody to stand above them, they prefer somebody who is semi-present and not always breathing down their necks. Being far away also makes America itself safe, since they don't have to worry about war at home. At this time the only country capable of taking war to America is America, so this probably influences many of its political decisions and allows them to always be on the offense. Getting back to China, there seems to be a lot of arrogance coming out of it, especially in the last 10 years. The arrogance is based on its history and belief that it is the Middle Kingdom. Uh, Brzezinski mentions China's desire for revenge for the past couple of centuries of humiliation. For China, the culprits are Russia, Great Britain, Japan and America, and it considers that Russia and Great Britain have already been punished. So we can see where China's red will be directed if an opportunity arises. I think China knows it is not ready for any serious confrontation with the West because of its current geographic limitations. If you look on the map, China could be easily blocked during military conflicts from access to the Pacific by countries who are not its friends. And that's why Taiwan is so important because it offers China direct access to the ocean. Further, Brzezinski analyzes Japan's geopolitical position and its options. Basically, it is America or China. It could also become a leader in some type of local anti-Chinese alliance, but Asia seems to be too fractured and too nationalistic to create anything resembling NATO or EU. There also is the question of Korea, which is only a question of time before it reunifies. I think a unified Korea would be Japan with nuclear weapons, an economic and military powerhouse. In the conclusion, Brzezinski warns of possible decrease of American presence in the international geopolitical game. He writes, Moreover, as America becomes an increasingly multicultural society, it may find it more difficult to fashion a consensus on foreign policy issues, except in the circumstances of a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat. To sum it up, the grand chessboard is about America as the only true global superpower and the challenges it faces. In the long run, global politics are bound to become increasingly uncongenial to the concentration of hegemonic power in the hands of a single state. Hence, America is not only the first, as well as the only, truly global superpower, but is also likely to be the very last. 
The book is an interesting view of the global political situation, but somewhat one-sided, benefiting above all American supremacy in the long run. The Grand Chessboard packs a lot of information in its 200 plus pages to be digested, and it is accompanied by some statistical charts and tables and many maps to reinforce its premise. Some of the details might seem dated or even wrong, but the general ideas presented are correct and explain how the geopolitical game is played. The 2016 edition, which I have, includes an epilogue written in that year by Zbigniew Brzeziński, which states that America somewhat failed to maintain its dominance and it is seen abroad as weaker, unwilling and even unable to act as the world's most powerful country. Brzeziński still believes that the future of the world's stability depends on cooperation between the US, China and Russia, but I think at this moment this ship had been sunk, at least for the foreseeable future. Ok, let's talk about the physical book. The book I am holding is a paper bag which I transformed into hardcover leather bound edition. To make the cover I use grade A naturally tan hide I buy from a tanner in North Spain. It is the same leather Louis Vuitton uses to make his bags, so it is top quality. I do all the processing of leather myself. First I designed the cover and what I did here, I took this grunge industrial like painting of the chessboard with some pieces and I thought it went nicely with the title. Uh, this is the back with the blurb and inside the front cover I printed a quote from the book. If you want to see a more detailed video where I explain how I transform paper back into leather hardcover, Click on the link in the description. I will make a maximum of 100 editions of each title. Each one will be numbered and initialed and the numbers will go in chronological order from 2 up since number 1 stays with me. The price will be around $100 so if you would like me to make one for you, you can click below on my email and send me a message. I do not guarantee I will do it since it will depend on the time I have available, access to leather and if I can get my hands on the copy of the book. Now if you are not willing to spend the hundred dollars but you still want the book, what you can do is click below on the PayPal link and donate three or more dollars to my channel and for every 100 donations I will make a lottery and draw one name and the winner will receive the book. So if you are cheap but feel lucky, this might be the way to do it. Also your donations give me the extra motivation to make the book reviews and I appreciate them very much, so thank you in advance. One more thing, when you make your donation, remember to include the title of the book you would like to win. Book you would like to win. The book, the book. The book itself is beautiful. Visually it has a very nice texture, it smells great and the more you handle it, the more beautiful it will become. And it makes a great gift for yourself or somebody who appreciates books. So if you want one, don't snooze or you might lose. Well, that's it, so let's end it here and until next time, keep your ear close to the ground and read a book. Adios.